Welcome back to the Sleep for Performance channel. Today we're going to be talking about a recent publication, Pajamas, Polysomnography and Professional Athletes, the role of sleep tracking technology in sport. Now this was a collaboration that I undertook recently with the team with Siesta Group. And Siesta Group is a group that's been started by Matt Driller at Latrobe. Very clever name. Matt has reverse engineered this in to look at sleep in exercise and sports technology analytics to come up with the name Siesta. Well done, Matt. This was a paper that I collaborated with Matt, uh, Shawnee Almond, Omar Bokris, Shawnee Stevenson, Carrie Lambie, and Amy Bender. Some of those names you may recommend, rec recognize or recommend from the podcast. And so this uh, review was published in the journal called Sports recently. So obviously this is a topic that's of interest to many people. Now the paper is freely available, it's open access. You can click on the link in the notes of this episode to read it in detail yourself. So we know that sleep research in athletes has grown considerably over the last decade. We've seen this through Michael Lasella's research um, at Central Queensland University, where he publishes, publishes very good bibliography looking at the sleep and athletic research from about 1966 through to 2019. And what we see in this as well, that we see this massive sort of increase in research, particularly since about 2010, 2011. So we know that people are really starting to focus more on the role of sleep in athletic performance and recovery. We've seen obviously more technologies, more tools out there. We've seen more questionnaires as well out in the, in the research field or even in occupational settings as well, or in the general population where people are just becoming more interested in sleep. And so this is really interesting. So one thing to note, um, and what we've discussed in this paper as well, as just after our introduction, is the importance of uh, sleep cycles and sleep stages. As you can see from this picture here, we go through a number of different cycles uh, across the night. Now, you would, have, you would have seen some research saying that in general we go through 90 minute periods of a sleep cycle each and every night. That's uh, highly variable depending on the individual and depending on a whole host of other factors. But what we do know is that we do go through predominantly two kind of phases of sleep, those being non-REM, non-rapid non eye movement sleep, which is really important for physical repair and recovery, and we go through a period of what's called REM sleep, rapid eye movement, which is really important for psychological repair and recovery. So these two phases is what we generally go through each and every night. Now predominantly you will have more non-REM at the first half of the night, and you will have more REM at the back end of the night. So early morning awakenings may affect the amount of REM sleep you get, which may lead to uh, cognitive um, performance issues the next day. And also as well, if you are not getting enough REM sleep, sorry, non-REM sleep, you may have some physical um, performance issues the next day as well. And physical performance uh, is really attributable to these non-REM periods of sleep. And we also see as well that in stage three sleep, that growth hormone or testosterone is released as well. So very important, particularly for those athletes as they age. And as you can see there in that graph as well, we see this distribution in general of the percentage of your sleep period that should be in each one of those different areas. And as we said, there's been an increase in this uh, area of sleep and athletic research with over 80% of the overall journal articles published in this field um, since 2011 uh, regarding sleep in athletic populations. Mostly sleep research in the athletic population has evaluated the effect of sleep restriction or sleep deprivation, as has been the case actually in a lot of general population studies as well, and the accumulation of sleep debt on various physiological and psychological and performance outcomes. Now, many people will talk about the benefits of sleep for performance, as in this channel. And, but the truth is actually, there is not too many um, studies out there that have actually looked at what is the benefit of increase in sleep. One study is out there is by Sherry Mai and colleagues in 2011, which showed that improvements in sprint time and shooting accuracy in 11-1-1 collegiate basketball athletes when sleep was extended from six and a half hours to eight and a half hours over a five to seven week period. And similarly, a study of 29 elite rugby union athletes showed that longer sleep duration during the preseason may enhance aerobic capacity and body composition over a three week period. So we do know from the limited research out there, there is benefits to increasing our sleep or optimizing the sleep. The other thing we need to think about as well in this area is sleep disturbances, as we can see here in the graph. We've got sport factors and non-sport factors. So sport factors would obviously be high training loads, unfamiliar sleeping environments if we're changing for training camps or traveling, and night before the competition as well, cognitive arousal, particularly for individual athletes, and depending on the type of sport as well. I often make the comparison as there's one thing went out the next morning, 
to run in a 10k uh, cross-country race and there's another thing then to get into a cage or an octagon in your underwear and fight in front of people uh, two different uh, prospects really for the for the athlete and then we also have night competition as well which we see again in this example of like combat sports such as mixed martial arts boxing rugby union soccer and so on which is generally there for prime time tv um TV and TV rights and then also it's a good time for people to go and be able to watch these uh, sporting events as well we all don't have the luxury of sitting around watching a, a five-day test I don't think although I did over the Christmas then we also have non-sport factors this is obviously social demands your family your friends and um, maybe there's extracurricular activities such as work and study commitments happening as well a lot of athletes may be studying for post um, professional career and if you're an amateur athlete these factors are even probably more important um, because you might have a job and there might be a whole host of other issues there that you've got to attend to uh, in the hours where you're not actually training for your event. See this a lot in sort of triathletes, ultra runners and swimmers as well, particularly the middle-aged type of man, uh, someone like me. Now, when we're looking at the hierarchy of sleep assessment, um, this is really important to know. And this, is, this area actually causes a lot of confusion for people because people often get this completely upside down and they rely on these very subjective, non-scientific measures of sleep. So let's have a look at this little table here beside us. So we have what's called polysomnography, which is the top level or the gold standard for the assessment of sleep. The advantages here, it's used for sleep uh, disorders, can be used for other tests as well. It is a bit cumbersome. As you can see here in the picture, it takes uh, a long time to set up and a lot of sort of electrodes and, and wires and stuff hanging off the person as well. It takes about 45 minutes to an hour to set somebody up. You may be saying to yourself, well, what's the benefit of that? They're not gonna have a good night's sleep. Well, we're not really looking to assess sleep behaviors. What we're really looking here to do is look for the potential prevalence of sleep disorders or other sleep problems as well. So I often liken this to taking a blood sample, doing a DEXA scan or someone going into an MRI. It's more like a diagnostic tool than actually looking at sleep habits and behaviors. But generally it only be really done for one, maybe two nights at the max. This is also the gold standard for determining sleep stages, what we spoke about, the REM and the non-REM periods are stages one, two, and three. Then we have polysomnography two, and then we have obviously polysomnography three and four. This is where we start drilling down to kind of lesser levels of polysomnography. So we start dropping off some of the channels, but this makes it a bit easier to do in occupational settings, such as remote fly and fly out camps or in training camps for athletes, or to do it at home as well, because not everybody can come into a sleep lab. And the other thing as well is we want to free up beds as well in laboratories or hospitals where a lot of these tests get uh, conducted overnight. So um, these do have a place and they do have benefits as well. Like I say, allow you to sleep in your own bed and maybe actually be more representative of your sleep period um, for people at home. Particularly for athletes, if we want to look at changes in sleep architecture over multiple nights, this is very beneficial. So we want to look at like the weekend to a fight or a competition. This will be good to do because it doesn't take as long and it's easier to do. Then we move down into the wearable stage. Um, this is where you start talking about your Fitbits, your whoop straps, your smart watches, all these type of devices. And these often get divided out into sort of like clinical grade actigraphy actigraphy devices what they get called or non-clinical grade actigraphy but really what we're seeing is a, a blending or a melting of all of these into the one pot now at the moment because we do see lots of research happening using the ready band which i've used myself and validated in the laboratory we see fitbits we see actigraph which has been around for a long time in the general population and clinical disorders assess uh, clinical sleep disorder assessment area uh, acti watches similarly as well and now we see aura ring garments and apple watches as well it's important to note as well that all these devices when they come out are not actually medical grade technology. They're often called a physical activity tracker approved by the federal uh, drug, federal uh, the food, sorry, food and drug administration in the US. I always say federal drug administration, but it's the food and drug administration in the US or the uh, TGA here in Australia. So it's important to note that they're not actually medical devices or physical activity trackers. In general, we also recommend as well that we wear these for about two weeks to establish a baseline. One of the problems that we have with athletes is that we look from um, night to night variability or even people in the general population. They wake up in the morning and go, wow, I only got six and a half hours sleep last night. I'm going to be really tired. I only got 10% of REM and they start freaking out. And what can they do about it? Not much is the answer really on a day to day um, action. You can't wake up the next day and go, oh, I only got 10% REM and then apply some action that night to, to, to get more REM the following night. It's very difficult. The only real action you have is to increase your sleep duration. But again, these wearables are limited as well. For sleep staging, such as stages one, two, and three, 
they're highly inaccurate and highly variable. So it's really important to look at them in, in um, I suppose, really in isolation of what they are good for. Things like time at sleep onset, sleep duration, and wake up time. This is why we recommend that people wear them for at least two weeks. What we're interested in here is looking at the overall sleep habits and behaviors of the person or the athlete. We're not really looking for night to night variability. However, when we do collect those two or three weeks period, then we can see maybe a pattern in the variability or the night to night variability and see what's happening. And then we can apply some treatments to that for that person. Then we also have nearables and smartphone applications. And um, these are devices obviously placed in the room or near the bed as they say. Things like the Bedded, the ResMed Plus, um, Sleep Score, or Sleep Cycle applications as well. And so these have, um, again, a lot of variability with these and not much validation against polysomnography, the gold standard, the very first one I spoke about. We also have uh, validated sleep related questionnaires. We'll see these being used um, in many different groups. Uh, recently, Matt Driller has developed one called the Athlete Sleep Behavior Questionnaire. Amy Bender has developed one called the Athlete Sleep Screening Questionnaire. So these are two excellent questionnaires that can be used for athletes. Traditionally, in this area, the PSQI for sleep quality, the Epworth Sleepiness Scale for daytime sleepiness, the Berlin Questionnaire for sleep apnea, the ISI or Insomnia Severity Index for insomnia, and the Sleep Hygiene Index have been used in general populations, but may not be applicable or specific for athletes. And then finally, we have sleep diaries. This is a self-reported amount of sleep that you get. So many people will have a high degree of variability in the sleep that they report. Some people will vastly underestimate the amount of sleep to report and some people will vastly um, overestimate the amount of sleep that they get. It's very hard for us to quantify sleep in an unconscious manner because we're not conscious, we're not lucid. We can't really sit there looking at ourselves and um, projecting ourselves out and measuring our sleep overnight. So this is really important to remember this hierarchy of sleep assessments that's been used and we discussed this in the paper as well. So again, the paper is freely available. You can click on the link and go through it. Now, when we talk about PSG, um, these devices um, are used as the base or the gold standard to measure things again. So when we talk about wearables, they're very good to have high sensitivity in detecting sleep periods. So generally between 90 and 96%, uh, but lower specific specificity in detecting wake. And that ranges from 18 to 80%. So you can see a high degree of variability there, but the average is about 50%. So again, like everything, there is limitations to the uses, and that's again another reason why we want to look at longitudinal data or data that's more than two weeks. In this wearable device area, we see the wrist-worn devices or these actigraphy-grade watches, often referred to as smart watches now, or people often call them just Fitbits uh, as a general term, probably clever marketing by Fitbit. Uh, these are the most common wearable um, in research and athlete settings. And um, lots of these devices now obviously have sleep functionality in them. You may have seen on this channel where we discussed a number of these devices before, but some of these are out there, like we mentioned earlier on, the Whoop, the ReadyBand, the Fitbit, the Apple Watch, the Garmin, the Samsung, and the Polar. There are many devices out there that have sleep tracking capability. However, there's new wrist-worn technologies coming out or wearables that track not only sleep, but to look at skin temperature, pulse oximetry, heart rate, and heart rate variability. These advances in sensor technologies allow the prediction of sleep stages and may even raise red flags for potential sleep disorders. I think there's a long way to go on these yet. We do see a high degree of variability with these sleep stages. So hopefully the algorithms will get dialed in and um, these companies can get these, uh, you know, basically a little bit better in terms of the sleep staging. We also see finger worn wearables now as well, which many people may have seen, the Aura Ring, the, the other device called it HIM, THIM, Motive or Go To Sleep. These are just a number of devices that are out in the market as well. We also see clothing technologies emerging. So there's one called Smart, um, well, type of Smart Pajamas. This is called Pajamas or Pajamas, PHY Jamas. Uh, named due to the proposed physiological measurement, are a fabric integrated tracker connecting a network of fabric based sensors that monitor and provide key metrics of sleep. So, again, these are new things that are coming out. We also see head worn sensors that people can wear that are looking at EEG, which measure brain waves, EOG, which is measuring basically your eye movements overnight, and EMG, which is looking at your muscular um, activity as well. So, these will be generally placed on the head, around the eyes, and on the chin to look at these type of things. And this will be stuff like the SumFit from Compumedics, which is a device which is classified as either a level two or a level three polysomnography. And again, these show a promise as well for home-based or remote type of settings. We also see the Dream Headband as well. So D-R-E-E-M is another common head-mounted sleep device that uses five electrodes. Um, we've got two in the occipital, O1 and O2. 
we got the ones at the front, FP Z and FP seven and eight, um, and so this kind of gives us different measures across the across the brain. With the wearable technology as well, we see uh, lots of these emerging, just like the wearable technology. People probably like these a little bit more because they're not actually on you, um, very passive in nature, sitting in the room as well. Um, so there's lots of different ones out here, like the bed D8 mattress cover and rest on. Um, and obviously there might be some challenges here with other bed partners in the room or animals or pets. But from my limited reading on this, um, it says that I can actually specify who it's measuring. So yeah, probably, yeah, a lot of, interesting probably information behind us i'm not going to uh, basically comment on any specific one because i don't really know enough about them they're very new now wearable devices could be a good choice for individuals who dislike wearing um wearables while sleeping and many of them still lack validation again against the psg as we said sleep questionnaires as i said there's many questionnaires out there that have been used in the general population such as stop bang the berlin and so on or morning and evening questionnaire and this is where the benefit of the athlete sleep questionnaire sleep screening questionnaire by matt driller um, or the um, athlete sleep behavior questionnaire so we've got the assq by sorry that was amy bender's group and then the athlete sleep behavior questionnaire asbq by matt driller who both of obviously are authors on this paper as well so at the end of the day, we're all friends, even though we're trying to get to the same goal. Now, there's a lot of common measures that um, come out from these type of devices. And in our table here in the paper on table two, you will see the common measures from sleep tracking devices. And if you read some of my other research, you may be familiar with some of these measures, such as sleep onset latency, the time it takes to fall asleep, sleep onset time, the time the person actually falls asleep, total sleep time or sleep duration, so the actual amount of sleep that they get across the night, Wake after sleep onset would be the awakenings across the night. Wake time, so this is the time to wake up the next morning. Sleep efficiency, which is a percentage or efficiency de uh, derived from these measures. Time in bed. And then two very important measures that we start to look at a bit more as well, which are indication of social jet lag or poor sleep behaviors, which is sleep onset variance and wake variance in the morning as well. So this degree of variability will, will allow us to see where basically people's sleep patterns are being compromised. Um, now, one of the things that is an issue, I think, with a lot of these wearable devices, wearables and PSG, is due to the ease of the use of these systems, it is common for athletes, or even people in the general population, to become hyper-focused on their sleep output from these devices and become stressed about the staging. So we need to be very careful about using these. And to do this, we need to ensure that basically, you know, we're deploying these devices um, in combination with information, education, and the context of what we're trying to do. And again, 14, 21, or 28 nights is recommended when we're looking at sleep. We really want to look at long-term changes across um, periods of time for these athletes. And it also can be used then as well to indicate or measure changes in sleep education um, or sleep hygiene information over time. Um, in this paper here that we did in elite basketball players, you can see that we had a fairly substantial increase in sleep as measured by one of these wearable devices for the coaches and a new research coming out as well where we looked at master swimmers we didn't see much of a difference really due to a number of other factors but again in the paper we discuss how these uh, sleep hygiene education interventions can be measured and assessed using wearable devices a word of caution with wearables and wearables and psg is that we might have different personality types you know People may be perfectionists, they may be on this, on this quest for perfect sleep, uh, particularly athletes who are hyper-focused on a certain thing. And so sleep numbers are very good for obviously generating you know, targets and goals and tracking people as they move towards them, but it could exacerbate some sleep issues. And this phenomenon has been termed orthosomnia, with ortho meaning straight or correct and somnia meaning uh, sleep whereby individuals are preoccupied or concerned with improving or perfecting their wearable sleep data. So this is orthosomnia. So it's very important that we don't exacerbate this issue with our athletes. Again, with some of these devices as well, you may see some kind of crazy scores, readiness scores or recovery. We still don't know a lot about these. So these again should be taken with a pinch of salt or interpreted with caution as well. It's very important to talk to the athlete or talk to the individual to see how they're feeling on the day as well, which is a very important thing to uh, take into account. Data ownership and privacy is obviously a concern too. So given that sleep data may be considered as a type of medical record, care needs to be taken about data ownership and privacy. 
further sleep data and information of high profile athletes may be of interest to the general public. So ensuring that this data will not be compromised or leaked is of utmost importance. So in general, when assessing sleep, uh, tracking devices should be, uh, should be worn for an absolute minimum of seven nights uh, to ascertain sleep and wake behaviours. And depending on the capability and battery life of the device, it's recommended that they be used for even longer periods. And you keep hearing me harping on about this in this paper because it's really important that we don't get fixated on just one or two nights. We have to look at people over time. So this is uh, freely available, this paper, as I said, just click in the show notes. You can uh, get this paper open access. All the uh, references are in here in this narrative review. You can go and chase those down. As always, you can contact me at iandunican at sleepforperformance.com.au. Check out the rest of our YouTube channel as well for some of our videos and our podcasts. We also have a Sleep for Performance seminar on the 21st of June, 2023. If you go to the Sleep for Performance website, you can access all the previous seminars from 2022 and 2021. All those talks are freely available. Just put in your email address and you will be granted free access to the Kingdom of Information. Lots of blogs and info over there. Hope you enjoyed this paper. Until next time, sleep well.